Welcome to the USMLE Step 2 Success Podcast. I'm Dr. Rajani Kata, and together with my partner, Dr. Samir Desai, we share clinical cases with targeted teaching points to serve as a QBank podcast. Dr. Desai is the author of the Clinician's Guide to Laboratory Medicine. With over 200,000 copies sold and listed as one of the top medical books of all time by Medical Media Review, This guide to lab test ordering and interpretation is used in programs around the country. For more information, please see us at our website, thesuccessfulmatch.com. Note that this podcast is not affiliated in any way with the National Board of Medical Examiners, and cases and teaching points are not meant to serve as an official study guide or medical guidance. Welcome to part two of our episode on nephrolithiasis. In part one of this episode, we presented the case of a 35-year-old man with Crohn's who had experienced intense pain for two hours. It involved his lower right back, his flank, his lower right abdomen. He also had hematuria, and he was ultimately diagnosed with nephrolithiasis, also known as kidney stones. Now, once we have the treatment of the patient um, taken care of acutely, so pain management, hydration, antiemetics, and then determining a plan for what to do with the actual kidney stone, and that depends on the size of the kidney stone, now we have to really delve into pathophysiology. And that's what we're going to go into on this episode. Why did this patient have a stone in the first place? One of the key features here I want to go back to is that this was a patient with Crohn's disease. So he, let's say he had that four millimeter stone and he passed it spontaneously. What would you do next? Well, the key here is to figure out why the patient had the stone so that you can prevent recurrence. And that would involve two main things. You would analyze the stone to determine what it was made of, and then you would get a 24 hour urine collection to look for certain findings. And in our patient with Crohn's disease, what is the most likely cause of the stone? Well, it's likely related to increased oxalate in the urine. So let's go back to the pathophysiology of kidney stones. There's three main areas to be aware of here. One of the main causes of kidney stones is decreased urine volume. The second important pathophysiologic feature is an increase in urinary acidity. The third factor to know about is that you might have changes in urinary levels of certain compounds. And Dr. Desai's book, The Clinician's Guide to Laboratory Medicine, has a really nice table of what to look for when you're looking at your 24-hour urine collection. When I talk about that third factor, when you're looking at changes in urinary levels of certain compounds, the most common is going to be increased calcium in the urine. You might also have increased oxalate in the urine. You might also have increased uric acid in the urine, or you might have decreased citrate in the urine. So changes in urinary levels of these four compounds are a key pathophysiologic feature of kidney stones. I think it's going to be very helpful for you to learn, especially for these four particular compounds, key risk factors for each of them, and then key treatments for each of them. I could see any of these being a board question, and so it's probably helpful to just make a little table here centered around these four. So first, let's talk about increased calcium in the urine. That's the most common finding that you're going to see in recurrent kidney stones. And why would you have increased calcium in the urine? Well, the most common is going to be genetics. So here you're looking at your family history. Some people have a genetic tendency to have increased intestinal absorption of calcium, which leads to increased levels, which leads to increased excretion in the urine. Also remember, and this could be a board question, hyperparathyroidism could also increase calcium in the urine because hyperparathyroidism is going to pull calcium out of the bones. Those are the key risk factors. What's the key treatment? 
The key treatment would be thiazide diuretics. Fascinating, hydrochlorothiazide would be a treatment here. And that's because hydrochlorothiazide enhances reabsorption of calcium in the renal tubules. Let's go on to our second compound, and that's going to be increased oxalate in the urine. Here I think you should memorize two main causes. The first would be any type of small bowel pathology that causes malabsorption, and that could be your Crohn's disease. The second main cause would be a really high dietary intake of oxalate. When you're thinking about your small bowel pathology, that could be a number of different malabsorption conditions, maybe small bowel surgery, maybe your Crohn's disease, and you have a chain of events that leads to increased intestinal absorption in those conditions of oxalate. I think about calcium, oxalate, and citrate as being sort of, uh, you can think of them as sort of friends. So basically, calcium usually binds oxalate, but if you have a lot of fatty acids in your intestine, that binds the calcium, takes it away from the oxalate. So now calcium and oxalate are separated and you get higher levels of oxalate that are going to be absorbed and eventually make it into your urine. This is one where your patient with Crohn's disease, the likely pathophysiology is because of that increased oxalate in the urine. Now let's look at the third compound, which is uric acid. You might have increased levels of uric acid in your urine, but actually, interestingly, you, you could have increased uric acid systemically causing your uric acid stones, but most of them are actually due to increased urine acidity. And if you have increased urine acidity, which is contributing the, to the uric acid stones, the treatment would be to alkalinize the urine. So you might use sodium bicarb or you might use potassium citrate. So that's a treatment for uric acid stones. Now the fourth compound you really need to be aware of is citrate. Now citrate is the opposite. If you have decreased levels of citrate, that's going to predispose you to kidney stones. The way I think of it is citrate is kind of a bodyguard for calcium. So citrate complexes this with calcium, it sort of binds to it, and it decreases that calcium concentration in the urine. If you get rid of your citrate, you're gonna have higher levels of that calcium hanging around in your urine. So why would you have lower levels of citrate in your urine? Well, the key risk factors here, renal tubular acidosis or metabolic acidosis. And what would be your treatment? Your treatment would be to give potassium citrate. So I think it would be helpful to memorize all four of those. The other thing I think you need to memorize is struvite stones. We think that this is a classic board question. What are struvite stones? They are magnesium ammonium phosphate, and they are exclusively associated with urease-producing bacteria. So this would be in the setting of an upper UTI with urease-producing bacteria, such as Proteus or Klebsiella or Pseudomonas. If you see an E. coli UTI, that's not going to be associated with struvite stones because that's not a urease producing bacteria. So not E. coli. So our patient luckily is going to do well. He's a 35 year old man with Crohn's disease. So he has got small bowel malabsorption issues, which puts him at risk for increased levels of oxalate in his urine. So he might actually develop recurrent kidney stones. So if you have the stone, you're going to analyze the stone. You're also going to do a 24 hour urine analysis, and you're going to look for several markers. When you think about the pathophysiology, three main factors, a decrease in urine volume, a major factor, an increase in urinary acidity, also very important, and then finally, changes in urinary levels of certain compounds. And the four compounds to really learn well would be calcium in the urine, increase in calcium in the urine, increase in oxalate in the urine, increase in uric acid in the urine, or decrease in citrate in the urine. 
And for each of these four, it's important to learn what are the risk factors for developing that, and then what are the treatments that you would use. I can see those as being great board fodder. And then finally, remember struvite stones, magnesium, ammonium, phosphate, exclusively associated with urease-producing bacteria in the setting of a UTI, such as with Proteus or Klebsiella or Pseudomonas. 